Hey everybody, tomorrow is the day. It is the midterm elections and we thought it would be fun to have a conversation with Larry Savito. Larry is one of the most popular professors at the University of Virginia, my alma mater. He is the Robert Kent Gooch Professor of Politics at the University of Virginia and he's the director of the Center for Politics and Larry Every midterm and I think election has something called his, Sabato's crystal ball, his final projections. And so we wanted to see what he was thinking, finding out if you can trust the polls, by the way, because with all due respect, Larry has been wrong before. Hi, everyone. Thanks for joining us. Um, we'll see what he says about tomorrow. Either way. Hey, Larry. <laughs> Sorry, did I interrupt your dinner? Uh, you did, but you're you're worth it. Hi, Larry. How you doing? <laughs> I'm fine, Katie. I'm, it was nice to see you for the second time in two days. I know we got to visit uh, in your beautiful uh, what what do you your colonnade? What what should I call uh, that? Uh, Pavilion. Duh. Well, I had a, I had a great architect, but he's dead. Yeah. Yes, that Thomas Jefferson. He was a good architect. Um, but but Larry, a lot of people are, are joining us. And of course, we want to know what the Sabato crystal ball is saying for the results of tomorrow's midterm elections. I know your final projection that you released earlier today. Hi, everybody. Um, if you all have questions, um, you know, please let us know what your questions are in the comments. And We'll see if Larry can answer them. But you, your final projection, and I can say this because it was released, what, around noon today? Somewhere around there, yes. Okay. A good but not necessarily <laughs> great night for Republicans. Do tell, Larry, what do you mean by that? I mean that this is a midterm election in the middle of a Democratic president's term. And the Democratic president is not popular. He's not horribly unpopular, but he's somewhere between 40 and 45 percent, which means that essentially your party is going to be disadvantaged in many elections. And that's a national average. When you look at individual states that are more competitive, he may be in the 30s. So you look at each district and state separately. Uh, but uh, essentially, I think this was going to be a tidal wave year for Republicans until June. So until... you do think you, you are predicting a red wave? Well, no, I'm predicting a red tide, but I'm saying it was going to be. Oh, it was a sorry, tidal I didn't wave. hear that. Yeah, no, that's okay. I, I'm, uh, you know, getting old and I mumble a lot. Okay. No, you no, you don't. That was my bad. I can't hear. But go ahead. That's uh, okay. Um, until uh, Roe v. Wade was overturned. And the Dobbs decision evened up the contest to a certain degree. Now, of course, that was in uh, very early summer. And now we're in November. And if, if that decision had come down a few weeks ago or even a couple of months ago, I think the, the uh, uh, election would be looking somewhat different. I think Democrats would be more competitive in more places. But it happened when it happened. And the court normally releases opinions like that in June anyway. So because of that, um, I'm not saying that people aren't as angry as they were then. But let's face it, some people move on. They shouldn't, but they do. And well, it's surprising that, the, that, that people have short attention spans. And I was talking to some friends tonight at dinner, and we were saying the leak of the decision actually might have worked to the Republicans' advantage because the leak came out in May. The decision didn't come down till June, and maybe it wouldn't feel like it was in the past quite as much if it hadn't been leaked. But what surprises me, Larry, is the short attention span that so many voters have that 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 many people are not really being motivated. I think a lot are, by the way. But you would know from from polling, a lot of people are not being motivated by the overturning of Roe v. Wade. Yes, uh, essentially, inflation in the economy, uh, those issues or issue uh, construct has taken over the, the midterm. And of course, that plays right into the Republican Party's hands. Uh, they've used that extensively in virtually every race. 
because who isn't concerned about high inflation? You could argue forever about who's responsible for it. But the American public, historically at least, has blamed the incumbent administration. You know, we're, we Americans have to blame somebody for everything. And since a president is, is a handy a punching bag and his party controls very narrowly, both the House and the Senate, it makes sense that if you're really frustrated about it, you're going to say, we need a change. Well, it, no one can, can alter the inflation rate quickly, if at all, really. Uh, and the Republicans aren't going to do it once they're in charge, one assumes, of Congress. Uh, but that took over for a number of issues. And uh, abortion now normally is around 10, 15 percent of the motivating uh, factor in the electorate, whereas uh, inflation tends to be closer to half. Yeah, you know, um, by the way, I'm sorry, I'm, it's frozen for some people, but and a lot of people are commenting uh, that they have not forgotten about Roe. Um, you know, the early voting has been very, very significant. And uh, a huge numbers, I think, what was it, Adriana, 43 million? Mm -hmm. 43 million early voters. And uh, those tend to be Democratic voters, do they not? Yes, uh, early voting is accepted more by Democrats and Republicans, but it would be wrong to assume that they're overwhelmingly Democratic. It would be something on the order of 65, 35 or 60, 40. So there are a lot of Republican votes in there, too. And while 43 million is a lot of votes, uh, we'll get 120 million, maybe more than that in the midterm election as a whole. Uh, sadly, only about half of the public will actually turn out and vote. Uh, similar to 2018, but that's the highest turnout in a midterm we've had since 1914. So it just tells you that people aren't as involved and active in politics as they need to be, as they should be. But we work with what we've got. Uh, most of the midterm elections, Katie, when we were growing up, and you're, of course, much younger, but we had we overlapped, uh, most of the midterm elections had turnouts in the low to mid 30s, maybe about 40%. So this is much better, but it's still not good enough. Okay, let, let's, uh, I'm getting some interesting comments. A couple of people have asked, and ha how, how accurate are the polls, Larry? Listen, it's, it, they, they, they've shown to be faulty before. The, the whole system of polling is pretty antiquated. It's very, people don't tell the truth. It's hard to reach people on landlines. So, I mean, how accurate are the polls? And are you worried that you're, you might be misled on some of these? Uh, certainly, I'm worried about it because the polls, or many of them, were inaccurate in 2016. Many of them were inaccurate in 2018. Many of them were inaccurate in 2020. So why should we believe that, that there aren't going to be some inaccurate polls in 2022? Uh, the mistakes can go in both directions. The most significant error in recent, recent times has been uh, the fact that Trump voters have not been weighted or represented in the sample to the extent that they exist in the electorate. Partly that's because uh, the uh, Trump voters tend to not believe media organizations. They tend to be hostile to the idea of polling, uh, and they simply don't participate. They, the refusal rates are much higher. And that makes it difficult for pollsters to include them in the proportions that they will turn up on election day. Now, some pollsters have done better than others in compensating for that. But, you know, we were promised that the 2016 problems would be fixed in 2018, and they weren't, and they would be fixed in 2020, and they weren't. And I'm worried, yes, that some of them still aren't fixed. And you also have another problem, because mostly we use polling averages today through 538 or real clear politics. Well, they're being affected by the fact that the Republicans have organized a number of polling organizations that poll constantly everywhere. And they flood the zone in a sense. They end up uh, changing the proportions in the Republican direction. They don't totally change the polling averages. But in many cases, when I see a list of Republican polls and maybe one nonpartisan poll or one Democratic poll, uh, I tend to subtract a few points from the Republican total 
simply because uh, I don't think Democrats are being properly represented there. So there are different problems depending on the race, the circumstances, uh, and the balance in the district. Let's talk about what Bill Crystal tweeted yesterday, which I texted you afterwards. He said, hey, don't want to interrupt my Democratic friends when they're engaged in their favorite sports of the gnashing of the teeth and the tearing of the garments. But it looks as if the Democratic Party will have the best midterm performance by a party in the White House in two decades. That's a very different prediction than you're making, Larry. How can you both, how can you be so wildly divergent in your views? Well, Bill is wrong. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> I, I like I like Bill a great deal, and he's he's an incredibly bright guy, and has uh, really shown some courage uh, during the Trump years, and I salute him for that. I'm not sure what he was referring to. There are a couple of sites and a couple of people connected to the Democratic Party who are suggesting that the early vote totals. Uh, are producing a Democratic victory in some of the key races. Maybe they're right. I, I don't see it. Uh, I don't see uh, that the numbers actually add up in the way that they do. Now, look, I'm always prepared to be surprised. We were all shocked in 2016. I, I didn't know a soul in the political community who actually thought Donald Trump was going to be elected. So you can have a wild result. And in virtually every election, you have two or three massive upsets uh, in a Senate race or governor's race or something like that. So I'm, I'm open to all possibilities. But based on what we know from sources we trust, not the biased polls, not the, the banked polls to one party or another, uh, and to longtime historical trends, which we can also trace, in a sense, through the current vote. It does seem like Republicans are doing well in the House and almost certainly will take control of the House, probably by a decent margin. The Senate is very close. It could go either way. We have it slightly in the Republican direction. That's because the Republicans have more pathways to the 51 they need than Democrats have pathways to the 50-50 they need. It's a combination of which seats are up and who's running and uh, how competitive those races are. But we fully admit and stressed in our piece that we wouldn't be surprised at all if Democrats kept the 50-50 cent. I don't think they're going to gain seats. I see a lot of that on Twitter. And um, I salute the optimists. I think it's wonderful that uh, people can be optimistic in the face of, uh, face of all this data. But uh, in the end, you have to go with what you've got. We went with the information that we've got. Some of it's public, some of it's private, some of it public polls and private polls, some of it the judgment of people that we've trusted for decades who, who usually are right. Uh, just to give you an example in the Democratic direction, uh, the Nevada Senate seat is one of the most competitive and important. It could determine the fate of the Senate. Well, for months, we've been planning to move that into the Republican column. Uh, it seemed that most of the information that was public, not just polling, but other things, suggested that the incumbent Democrat, Catherine Cortez Masto, was probably losing to the Republican nominee, Adam Laxalt. And then something very interesting happened. Yesterday, Mr. Nevada Politics, John Ralston, who mm -hmm. uh, had a great record of calling races there, came out with his study indicating that the governorship would go Republican, but the Senate seat would stay with uh, Catherine Cortez Masto. So we switched that <laughs> based on John Ralston. People would say, well, that's crazy. You've got all this polling data. No, I've learned to trust the judgment of people who know what they're doing and have been there a long time. and uh, Who are really familiar with the state. Yes, you're familiar with the state? No, I said who are really familiar with yes, the state. Yes, who are familiar with the state. And have been exactly. following it carefully versus, say, national polls that right. may not be quite as granular, if you will. Yes, or pollsters who may not know the territory in Nevada as well as John does. So we, we decided to go Democratic in Nevada really based on John's recommendation. Now, if he's if he's wrong, he's wrong. Nobody's perfect. Nobody's going to get all the races correct. But it seemed justified to us. I interviewed a Harvard economist earlier today, uh, Larry, and he was basically saying that uh, 
you know, the economy was a global issue and uh, that, that Joe Biden really didn't have a lot to do with what's going on in terms of inflation, that it's more about supply chain issues from the pandemic and, of course, the war in Ukraine. Uh, that doesn't really seem to matter. I mean, I do think the Republicans have branded the administration with sort of tax and spend, right? Uh, uh, the tax and spend party. And that seems to stick, even though rationally, Joe Biden, as far as I could tell, and from this, this man's view, really this economist's view, it's, the economy is not really his fault. What do you think of that assessment? Well, uh, that is absolutely true, and it's politically irrelevant. It's absolutely true because this is a worldwide problem, and many industrialized countries have worse inflation than we do, including the UK, for example. Of course, Biden didn't uh, create the inflation. What what president would would uh, create inflation and cause himself lots of well, problems? Well, I mean, it, it, what I'm saying uh, were did did his policies fiscal policies contribute to where we are economically in any way, shape, or form? Well, it's possible that you could argue that some of the packages that were passed, infrastructure and the early COVID program, months after he took the oath of office, were, uh, were very expensive and it may have increased inflationary pressures. I think you could actually blame the Federal Reserve Board for their misjudgments more than you could blame the president. But, but Katie, you've been around a long time and you know, you know human nature. And human nature is that most people know they don't understand the way the big things work. And they also know that they're angry and frustrated and they're gonna take it out on somebody. And before we, before, yeah, before we get to some specific states, Larry, and by the way, I'm talking to Larry Sabato, a good friend of mine and a professor at the University of Virginia very popular professor, I might add. Before we get to a couple of key states and some Senate and gubernatorial races, you know, crime has really seemed to work in the Republicans' advantage, to the Republicans' advantage in terms of their talking points. When Paul Pelosi was attacked, it was interesting to watch commentators on Fox News basically say, see, crime happens everywhere. Instead of, you know, I think, um, you know, criticizing the attack and, and, and having harsh words for what had happened. They were sort of pivoted once again to crime. And a lot of that seems to have really stuck that, that the, the big cities are out of control. Can you give us some real perspective and actual facts about the crime rate in some of these big metropolitan areas? Sure, it varies by, by area. Right. And, and the pandemic actually reduced the overall crime rate because people weren't mixing, and that included the criminal class. So uh, for part of, the, of uh, the pandemic period, including Biden's term, crime actually declined, and certain categories of crime have declined. But Katie, again, you were a small child in 1968. But in 1968, you remember the Republicans seized on this issue, law and order. It was uh, the theme along with ending the Vietnam War for Richard Nixon. Law and order, law and order. We're going to have law and order. And because we had had a lot of riots in the cities, uh, race riots in the cities, and that's the comparison with today. Black Lives Matter, some of the uh, demonstrations became riots, you know, Portland and some other places. And they have been used, those riots have been used to undermine uh, what Democrats would say is, is are social goods that have to be uh, properly distributed in order to uh, create an environment that would reduce crime. But that's a soft approach. People react to crime by wanting to bash heads. People well, react think, to- I was just gonna say, sorry to interrupt Larry, but I was just gonna say, do you think the Democrats the Democratic Party should have had a harsher, stronger reaction about the destruction that we saw during some of these demonstrations? Yes, and they should never, ever have used the phrase defund the police. 
that is one of the dumbest things that I have seen in politics in decades. Now, that's not to say the police don't need changing, but you use the word reform. Reform right. the police. People love reform. Americans love reform. But a segment of the Democratic Party insisted on using the words defund the police. That frightened middle America. It frightened suburban America. Uh, they had been moving more toward the Democrats. They did really in 2020 in electing Biden. And it pushed them back. And it's costing Democrats this year. So, yeah, that, matter, that mattered a lot, as did, quote, border security. That is the immigration yeah. problem. Right. I feel like crime and immigration, inflation and, mm. you know, gas prices, that has been a pretty effective and helpful combination of, of circumstances for Republican candidates. But, you know, something that you and I talked about on Sunday, and I know some of the comments earlier, I turned them off you all because they were so distracting. If you have questions for Larry, feel free to put them in the question mark area, whatever that's called. But <clears throat> a lot of people are worried about our democracy. When Okay, so my latest poll that I, the latest poll I just read, 66% of Republicans think that Joe Biden was not legitimately elected, despite the fact that how many courts have, uh, have, have basically handed down decisions or have found no, no evidence of a rigged election. So you've got 66% of the Republican Party. You have something like 300 plus candidates who are election deniers. This whole election denialism movement has really spread like wildfire in a very dangerous way. Um, it sounds like such a no brainer, but clearly this is extraordinarily concerning. And talk to me about your fears. If a lot of these people who say Joe Biden isn't our president, the election was rigged, if they in fact uh, win their elections tomorrow. Well, I'm very concerned about it, and I think millions of people are and should be concerned about it, because after all, that's at the heart of everything we do and everything that we are. And if we can't preserve uh, the basics of democracy and have them embraced by people uh, of both parties and independents and third parties and so on, we're not going to have a republic as long as we'd like to have it. Uh, so it is deeply concerning. And number one, let me say, the obvious, but it has to be stressed. I, I work it into every talk, every speech, every lecture, because I've learned it has to be said. There was no widespread fraud in 2020. It was invented. It was made up in order to massage the ego of the president who lost. It was all made up, and he knew it was all made up, and his close associates knew that it was all made up. It was just a political gambit to try to seize a term, an extra term for Donald Trump. One of the great outrages of American history that will be condemned through the ages, believe me. Now, why do 66%, and I've seen other polls that have it at 70, let's just round it up and say, why do two thirds to 70% of Republicans uh, say they believe uh, in election denialism? Some of them actually believe it. You know, people like the, the, the gubernatorial candidate in Arizona, Carrie Lake, I think they actually believe it. And, and that's- Do you terrible. really? Do yeah. You, I mean, I, or, or are they like OJ, like who convinced himself he didn't murder Nicole Brown Simpson and Ron Goldman because he said it so many times, he convinced himself. I don't know. I don't know. I mean, you know, it seems to me they they conflate like, oh, or they say, there's something that was just kind of fishy. They can never really specific, specifically cite circumstances, but then they, they, they blow it up to, to basically say the whole thing is rigged. And, you know, there have been instances, but very, very, very small, and instances that would never change the outcome of the election. And yet they hold on to this this untruth, this lie. And, you know, I think it's because they hear it constantly on 
right-wing media. They hear it constantly from the elected official, you know, who they're supporting, or the, the candidate, rather. And so it becomes almost ingrained in their minds, and they're so invested. It has become identity. I mean, this is the ultimate identity politics, right, Larry? Yes. And Katie, what they're really saying is, I was going to say, some people believe it. The majority of them know it isn't true. But what they're really saying is, I support Donald Trump. I thought he was a good president, great president. I think Joe Biden is horrible. And that's what they're really saying. It's now an article of faith, and they have to express it. They have to express it in order to win their credentials for their group, their club, their society, their party. Uh, and, and so it's become a rite of passage for Republican candidates. And people that I personally know who don't believe it at all and who will say to, say to me and others privately, of course it's nonsense, will go right out and tell the crowds of Republican activists just how horrible the 2020 election was. And they have deep questions about it. Of course, they don't have deep questions. Well, There's nothing to question. When they say that to you, Larry, do you say, how can you be so dishonest with the American <laughs> people? I mean, do, I mean, do they, it's so craven to me. And, and the height of obviously not just political opportunism, but just, it's just indecent, honestly. And if you did you challenge them, the people who say, oh, I know it wasn't rigged, but then they go out and they rile everybody up. What do they say when you say them? Why in the, how can you do that? They say it's practical politics. And they will frequently turn it back on me and say, you of all people who have been around politics since you were seven years old, you know the way it works. And we have to do this. You know, what did the Republican leader say to Liz Cheney? Why did she have to go public? She could have believed all this and just kept it to herself. It wasn't going to make any difference. It would have blown over and she'd be fine. She'd still be in the Republican leadership. She'd still have her seat in the House of Representatives. Okay. Uh, yes, she could have done it that way. But I think Liz actually wanted to look at herself in the mirror in the morning. Have you talked to her about her experience at all? Has she come to the to the university and spoken at all or been interviewed? We're going to have her next semester. I personally had a chance to talk with her, yes. And uh, <clears throat> I, I admire her courage. Um, I wish somehow uh, you know, she could bottle and sell courage uh, to some of her compatriots. Um, you know, the governor here in Virginia, he didn't admit that Biden was president until Biden was several months into his term. He knows better. He's a very intelligent guy from the corporate world. He knew very well that Biden was elected. He knew very well that Donald Trump was lying. But he couldn't bring himself to cause himself problems. He just went right along with the program, you know, uh, tiptoed through the tulips. It is so it is so discouraging, Larry. And and <clears throat> talk about the practical um, impact of these people becoming becoming elected officials, becoming governors, becoming secretaries of state, becoming members of the House and Senate. Uh, can you talk about what that means and the kind of power they'll be given and and how democracy may in fact suffer in sure. their hands? Well, of course, every four years we have a presidential election and just uh, tomorrow you will have X number, I don't know the exact number because I'm not sure about all the races for Secretary of State, but you will have a certain number of real election deniers like the Republican nominee out in Arizona, who really believes it. He was the one featured on that 60 Minutes segment that your friend Scott Pelley did a couple of weeks ago. He actually believes it. And once he is in power, and once Carrie Lake is governor, if in fact she's elected tomorrow, uh, and the attorney general who's on their slate and is another election denier, once these people are in office in Arizona and whatever other states like Nevada, where they might very, very well win. 
Uh, what they will do after the 2024 vote comes, well, even before the 2020 vote is taken, 2024 vote is taken, they're going to find ways to suppress the vote, uh, minimize uh, those who can use uh, the uh, early voting or mail-in ballot, as is being done in Pennsylvania right now. So that will happen before the election. After the election, they'll discount ballots to the extent they can. They'll claim that ballots were stolen, ballots were manufactured in China, you know, with that ridiculous theory about bamboo paper and space lasers. And it's, it's just hard to remember all of it without laughing. They will come up with these rationales and uh, the states do have significant power in deciding which electors to send to, uh, to Congress. And the Supreme Court has a role in this, too. They're considering a case that's been brought before them that could bring state legislatures into full power in federal elections so that they couldn't be overridden. They well, couldn't be overridden. So therefore, we could get a president elected by even more than Hillary Clinton won the popular vote by or Joe Biden won the popular vote by in 2020, who is simply not allowed to become president because they managed to construct an electoral college majority out of people who are pledged to vote for the loser in their states. I mean, it, it's outrageous and it ought to worry everybody, but people don't focus on things like that, Katie, until it becomes a crisis. That's when we think about things. And, and as Bill Maher said in his monologue that you and I watched together in the pavilion, in your pavilion is, you know, this is not retroactive. You cannot go back and reinstate democracy after it crumbles. And he talked about crossing a Rubicon in this very important election. And I wish people would understand kind of the machinations that are going on in the state legislatures and secretary of state races and even a gubernatorial races that could actually be setting up things so the next election could actually be rigged. Well, that's absolutely the case. They, they People need to follow this. It's arcane, uh, but they need to follow it. And their leaders need to make clear to them what the stakes are, why this matters so much. Uh, and I think, you know, the media has been trying to do that. Some of the leaders have been trying to do that. But people also have to care because Bill Maher was right in suggesting once democracy has gone, you have a hard time reconstructing it because the values on which it depends may have been destroyed or damaged so badly that you can't restore them. And I think everybody should be concerned about this. Uh, unfortunately, they're not. I've been trying to talk about it for months now, ever since I interviewed a guy named Rick Hassan, who is uh, yes. a law professor. I don't know if you know him. I, know I think him. at the University of California, he's been screaming from the mountaintops about this, Larry. But unfortunately, I don't think enough people clearly are listening. Um, let's take some state races. By the way, if you, <clears throat> excuse me, you guys, if you're just joining us, I'm talking to my good friend Larry Sabato of the University of Virginia, the Robert Kent Gooch professor. You'll have to tell me who Robert Kent Gooch was at some point, Larry. Sure. He, he I was should a, know uh, that. He, was, he also lived in this pavilion, but decades before I did. So I, I never take his name in vain because his ghost may be here for all I know. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> definitely don't do that. All right, let's talk about some key Senate races and let's throw in a couple of gubernatorial races. And I'm trying to get to your questions, everybody, because 21 people have asked questions and um, I, wanna, I wanna get to a few of them. Okay, let's talk about some of these key races in the Senate. Uh, Arizona, okay, Mark Kelly versus Blake Masters. Blake Masters is kind of uh, kind of backtracked on his positions on abortion, cleaned his website, sort of had a, a uh, electoral conversion of sorts. Um, who that that race is pretty tight right now, neck and neck. What are you guys seeing in that race? And by the way, we want everyone to vote because these races are very, very tight. And by no means is this a done deal. This is just Larry's crystal ball. And 
Larry has been wrong in the past. And rarely, so, rarely. Very, please, very please, rarely. please, whatever you do, get out and vote because, um, you know, that's incredibly important. Sorry, Mark Kelly, Blake Masters, what do you, what do you think? I believe, we believe that that uh, Mark Kelly will win, but it is extremely close. Kelly has run a near perfect campaign. He has had two very constructive years in the U.S. Senate. He's well liked in Arizona. Um, Gabby Gifford's yeah. husband also distanced yes. himself uh, from Joe Biden, not just in campaign rhetoric, but in some of the things he's done as a senator. Yes. Yes, no, that's absolutely true. Of course, you've got the two most powerful letters in the English language at work here, D and R. And the Republicans have a pretty good chance to win the governorship. That leads the ballot. It's possible that that will create enough of an undertow to pull Kelly down and elect the Republican Blake Masters. Uh, at this time, we think Kelly will be able to pull it out, but it is going to be very close. You're talking about you're talking about Carrie Lake, who's a former TV news anchor, was a Democrat, voted for Obama, if I'm not mistaken, has now become really, I think, if 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 Sarah Palin and Donald Trump had a baby, it might be Carrie Lake. <laughs> That's a scary thought, but yeah. Yeah, I, I can't think in those terms, Katie, but you, but you may be right about that. But she is kind <laughs> of a, a, a very, very, very Trumpian and quite skilled at it. Oh, yes. Well, she she was in your profession, Katie. I have to blame your profession. You you created and trained uh, this person as an anchor woman. She was, uh, she was uh, well known in Arizona. She did have a massive transformation of philosophy. I don't know what caused it. Uh, but uh, it's pretty clear that she is able to communicate very well. She's a great communicator. Uh, if people listen more carefully to what she was saying about the 2020 election, I think they would realize just how far off the mark she is. But in Arizona, there are a ton of people who believe the 2020 election was stolen without any evidence. And coupled with the fact that she's running against Katie Hobbs, the Secretary of State, who has refused to debate Carrie Lake because I think she does not want to get ensnared in all this uh, rigged election, election denialism. But that probably wasn't a great, great idea, was it? She's kind of been, I, I, again, you, you know better than I, but I've gotten the impression she sort of receded into the back, background. I think it was a mistake for her not to debate. I understand why. Carrie Lake is a trained, skilled television performer. Uh, and that inevitably is going to give her an advantage. But debates don't last that long. And you have a, an outline of several points that you want to make. And you just keep going back to them. And at least you get your points across to the TV audience, and not that many people watch anyway. Unfortunately, I think everybody ought to watch debates, but they don't. So yeah. she could have survived it, and then she would have had that off her plate. She couldn't be attacked for not debating Carrie Lake, but she never wanted to do it. I do think a lot of people would have watched, though, I, I, I think, Larry, because it was sort of like the Fetterman-Oz debate. Um, I think you know a lot of people paid close attention to that. John Fetterman did have difficulties um, expressing himself uh, because of his stroke. And Mehmet Oz, talk about a, a creature of television. Dr. Oz, of course, feels completely natural on, on camera. So let's take that race. Um, how much did that debate hurt John Fetterman? And how much has Oprah's endorsement helped him and, or, and hurt? Mehmet Oz, because she's the one who made him and created him. Uh, where do you see that race shaking out? There's another extremely close one. Uh, my team wasn't fully united on that. Um, but uh, because of party ID, uh, we thought that Oz had a reasonable chance to win that. But I have to tell you, it is so close. And that if there are any people from Pennsylvania watching, they should absolutely go out and vote if they have not already submitted their ballot because it's going to come down to a relatively small number of votes, as Pennsylvania races frequently do. Uh, Fetterman has an advantage in that the 
Democratic candidate for governor, Josh Shapiro, uh, is going to win handily because the Republicans ran an extremist, Doug Mastriano, and he's going to lose badly. Uh, and that will help Fetterman. You know, you can create uh, some additional votes for a candidate via coattail. So uh, that's an advantage for Fetterman. On Oz's side, Trump has tremendous support in rural areas in Pennsylvania. It showed in both 2016 and 2020. Uh, and I think he's been able to transfer a lot of that to Oz. He's been and Oz's main sponsor. And now, we've been hearing a lot about a split ticket, you know, people voting for, for Josh Shapiro and Mehmet Oz. And especially I've been reading again, who knows, but suburban women, um, I think are, kind of possibly splitting splitting the ticket in those races. Nevada, you mentioned that your friend uh, who you respect thought that they would hold that Senate seat, Catherine Cortez Masto against Adam Laxalt, Paul, La Paul Laxalt's son, right? Yes, um, yes. So, so you're thinking that Nevada stays Democratic? Yes, we're, we're basing that on John Ralston's analysis. Uh, okay. you, you need a local to understand Nevada politics. It's it's even more complex than most states. Uh, you know, somebody asked about the Latino vote. How impactful is the Latino vote going to be in the midterm elections? Nevada is a good test case for that, isn't it? Because yes. of a lot of um, people who work, um, I think, in, in Las Vegas, for example, and the unions are so strong there. And uh, how is the Latino vote shaping up in, in the state of Nevada and for that matter elsewhere? Uh, the Latino vote can't be. Uh, it's not monolithic. It's right? not monolithic at all. It's important that people understand that the Latino vote, Hispanic vote in South Florida is becoming more Republican. Not totally so. Democrats tend to carry a majority, but their majorities used to be two to one. Now it's more like if they're lucky, 60-40 or maybe 55-45. Uh, that's also true in South Texas, where you're going to see Republican gains, I think, uh, tomorrow. Um, it's uh, true in a few California districts, but less so in California. Arizona and Nevada are the two places that I'm going to be looking to uh, because of the influence of the Latino vote and its effect on two very close and important Senate races. So we'll be lovely at that. Um, I'm just asking Adrian if she can do me a favor and get me a glass of water because my throat is dry. But um, okay. here, have some of mine. I wanted to ask you about. I, I know I keep looking. Oh, thanks, Adriana. I have we have our water here from Starbucks from this morning, but it will do. Um, uh, I want to ask you about Georgia, Herschel Walker ra versus Raphael Warnock. Yes. I mean, Larry. Yes, incredible. Absolutely incredible. And I have to tell you that Warnock uh, has run the better campaign by far and has not been subject to the kinds of scandals and investigations that have been focused on Herschel Walker. And yet, and yet, at worst for Herschel Walker, he's tied. He could very easily win this election, very easily. I don't know if he can avoid a runoff. Uh, and maybe if it goes to runoff, the, the storyline will change, particularly if the Senate's already decided. Then there will, the stakes will be lower for, uh, uh, for that election, and people might feel freer to move to a candidate who has less scandal. But uh, there's no question that the Republican governor, uh, Brian Kemp, is going to be reelected pretty handily without a runoff. And he is helping, again, party labels matter. The ticket matters. He is helping Herschel Walker, even though I don't think he's personally that crazy about Walker, because Walker is so close to Donald Trump, who tried to defeat Brian Kemp. Uh, right. but, uh, but I can tell you, it's uh, Herschel Walker has not been much affected by either of those allegations that he pushed women to have abortions while he is completely pro-life. Uh, there's a classic example of massive hypocrisy, and yet it's having no impact. 
It reminds me of Trump in 2016. Uh, at, at Hollywood access, access Hollywood, no effect, no effect. Everybody wrote him off, no effect. And Stormy Daniels and loads of other things have had no and effect. As, and he himself said, I could shoot somebody on Fifth Avenue and yeah. it wouldn't matter. Um, Probably that was true. He said, someone asked, how will Georgia survive if Herschel wins? Well, uh, you have two senators from a state, <laughs> so I guess you can rely more on John Ossoff, the other senator. Uh, and look, Herschel Walker is to vote for the Republican line in the Senate. He will do as he is asked to do. Uh, he'll, I assume, have a carefully constructed staff around him. I, this is an assumption that he's actually elected, but he'll have a staff that is responsive to the leadership, and that's mainly what they want. They want a vote, and that's why they're pushing so hard. Uh, many of them wondered whether they could push him out when the first allegation of abortion, uh, pushing for an abortion, came up. But they didn't see a way to do it. Walker was unwilling to do it. The leadership wouldn't push out against it. Trump was strongly supportive of him. So they felt stuck, and they may win anyway. Somebody said, what the hell is wrong with Virginia and Youngkin going after LGBTQ, abortion, et cetera? Since you are a professor at the University of Virginia, I thought you could take a crack at that. Sure. Uh, he was elected with some in the media, as well as some in politics, saying that Youngkin was a moderate. He is no moderate. He has not been a moderate. He hasn't governed as a moderate. He's not going to govern as a moderate because he wants to run for president or position himself to be picked for vice oh. president. He has been very, very conservative. I I'm so sorry. I'm getting frantic notes from your team saying that you have a hard out. And I've just been keeping you too long, Larry. I'm no, so I'm, sorry. I just love talking to you. I, enjoy, I enjoyed it, Katie. I enjoyed it. Now, we've got um, a scheduled interview with CNN International coming up in about five minutes. Well, so that's, come on, that's Katie. Katie, yeah, no, I mean, you're going to give priority over CNN International? No, I, you, you, are, you are my one, two, and three priority. I absolutely Katie. agree. Maybe hey, four and five. Before we go, real quickly, Ohio, J.D. Vance or Tim Ryan? J.D. Vance, because Ohio is no longer a bellwether. It has, has become a solid Republican state, solid meaning 54, 46, somewhere in that vicinity. Uh, Ten years ago, Tim Ryan would have won easily. He is Ohio through and through. Okay. J.D. Vance is, is Trump's choice, and I think inevitably he will win. And you see this all over the country. Party label matters now more than personal connection to the state. Oz is another example. You know, he's he's not particularly Pennsylvanian. I think he mainly lives in New Jersey, and he's got ten houses apparently all over. Something the place. that John that that Fetterman has has been using against him. And real quickly, because I am going to give your team uh, a heart attack. Beto O'Rourke, any chance that he could beat Greg Havitt? Get Greg. Abbott in Texas. No, no. And look, I, I like and respect Ben O'Rourke and I admire him for taking on some big challenges like running for the Senate against Ted Cruz, then running for president and uh, and now running for governor. He's, he's trying to make Texas more two-party competitive. But as far as winning, no, no. Okay. Um, Larry, thank you. Go do your interview with CNN International. Thanks for, gosh, we, we talked for like 50 minutes and a lot of people hung in for our conversation. And I think I just want to remind people, if you haven't voted already, vote, vote, vote. It's an extremely, I think this is one of the most important midterm elections of my lifetime. Oh, it absolutely is. As 2018 was. That's the reason you've, you've gotten a turnout much larger than usual in 2018. And I think we're going to have the same turnout this time. It's still abysmally low, though, Larry. What was it in 2018? It was 50%. It's 50%. I mean, it's come gonna on, be, America. It's going to be 50% okay. now, unfortunately. But remember, okay. when I was growing up, and, and you were, as I say, a little girl, 
uh, <laughs> we had uh, turnouts of about, you know, 38, 37, 38%, 40%. So it is much better. We're moving in the right direction, but we haven't moved far enough. All right. Well, listen, um, I'll be texting you tomorrow. If you hear, get any interesting info, let me know. Um, and, and I'll talk to you soon, Larry. Thanks so much. And everyone who joined us, thank you for being part of this really fascinating conversation with my friend, Larry Sabato. Wonderful to see you, Katie. And you, you keep doing all the things you do. I've said you have more energy than any 10 people put together. I don't know about that. I salute that. you. We, we love you at the University of Virginia. We appreciate everything you've done for us, including the recent gift, which was magnificent. I didn't have of a chance course. to tell you that Sunday, but I'm glad to tell you that now. Well, thank you, Larry. I appreciate that. And uh, you better go because your team is really mad at me now. Well, okay, they're young. To... They're young, Katie. They can afford okay. a heart attack. We can't. Okay. Talk to All you right. soon. See you later. Bye, Larry. Bye. Bye-bye.